Ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon. Thank you for joining uh, Bright Blue. This is our, gosh, I don't know how many fringe events we've done now, but it's a lot. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know Bright Blue, we're an independent think tank for liberal conservatism. We see our mission as defending and improving liberal society. We work across four main research areas, environment policy, social policy, educational policy, and employment policy. Uh, and we're doing this event in partnership with uh, our friends, the Konrad Adenauer uh, Foundation in Germany. And actually, we've enjoyed a long-standing partnership across many events and publications over the years. So we're very grateful to them for this partnership. And today's event is Responding to Russia's War in Ukraine, Safeguarding European Justice and Security. You can see that we've got a mega panel. Um, so we've got a lot of speeches to go through, and we're still, <laughs> and we're still expecting a couple uh, more speakers to arrive, including uh, Liam Fox. So a mega panel for you. Uh, but luckily, there's lots of people in the audience, so the speaker, the number of speakers, is not bigger than the number of audience uh, members, which can be <laughs> quite an embarrassing event. Um, so those of you, yeah, <laughs> those of you who are tweeting, please use the hashtag uh, Bright Blue and CPC22. Uh, and you can also mention us um, using our Twitter handle, which is We Are Bright Blue and at Kaz Online. There are people watching online. Hello to you, wherever you might be. Uh, you can interact with this event by asking us questions through uh, Slido, the link to which is below the YouTube screen that you're watching. Say who you are, where you're from, uh, and I will take those questions uh, and I will uh, ask them. Um, so. Um, we will have five minutes from each of the speakers, and then it's questions and contributions from you. But before uh, I do that, I'm just going to hand over to Matthias. Thank you very much, Ryan, and uh, yes, also a warm welcome. Welcome on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation to this event. Um, I'm very happy that we can cooperate uh, uh, today, not, of course, not only uh, on this occasion. Uh, just to let you know, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation is a German political uh, foundation uh, linked to the Christian Democratic Union, so the CDU. Uh, one of our main goals is to contribute to international uh, cooperation and uh, understanding. Uh, we have more than 100 offices in Europe and worldwide. And uh, for example, here uh, in London, we, are, uh, we opened our office in 1980, so we are always for more than 40 years here um, active in the United Kingdom together with our partners. And of course now I'm delighted to introduce um, the speakers on our panel. As Ryan said, it's really an incredible uh, lineup today. So I will start uh, to welcome um, Evie Aspinall. She's a senior researcher at uh, the, the um, British Foreign Policy Group. Then our good friend uh, David uh, Liddington, a former Deputy Prime Minister and currently also Chair of the uh, Conservative uh, European Forum. Uh, then we have two ambassadors, <laughs> um, uh, the ambassadors uh, of, of the, uh, the ambassador of the European Union here to the UK, um, Joao Valle de Almeida. Then uh, warm welcome also to uh, the German ambassador Miguel Berger, a German ambassador to the United Kingdom. Uh, then uh, Günther Krings, who is a member of uh, the German Bundestag, or as we say in German, Mitglied des Deutschen Bundestages. He's uh, currently spokesman uh, of our parliamentary group on legal affairs, and he was a former state secretary at uh, our home office. Uh, and then, last but not least, uh, I learned that Liam Fox will join us, but a bit later, uh, Liam Fox, uh, I think since 1992, a member uh, of, the, of the House of Commons, and uh, he was also a, state, um, a, a former state secretary uh, for defense. So, I would like now to ask each uh, speaker to give a short five-minute uh, introductory remark, and I would like to give the floor to uh, the German ambassador. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Werner, Konrad Adenauer, Stiftung Bright Blue, and it's obviously a pleasure to have members of the German parliament also here, and Mr. Frings on the, on the panel, and so many uh, ambassador colleagues. So very briefly in, in, in five minutes, um, uh, I think that uh, it was in, in last June when we took, I think, fundamental decisions uh, in, at NATO, but also at the European Union, which were really to the level of a strategic decision up um, to confront the challenges. I think we have increased our enhanced forward presence in the Baltics and other 
country. So I think we have shown that NATO is ready and prepared, and we were especially glad of having Sweden and Finland uh, nearly joining. I think many countries have already ratified. The German Bundestag has ratified, so we are waiting for some outstanding. But all of that, I think, um, is a very strong and good response so far from NATO. Where are we now? I think since Putin's speech, I think it was on the 21st, if I recall it uh, correctly, my assessment, our assessment is that we are in a, in a new and more dangerous phase of this conflict. Um, I think that this reaction to Ukrainians' uh, bravery, Ukraine's uh, advancement, uh, calling for this fake uh, sham referendums, uh, also yesterday the decision of the Duma for the annexation of, of uh, this parts of Ukraine, this is obviously something that is narrowing the political space because it is absolutely clear that we cannot accept anything that is decided under force and uh, annexation of, of territory. So the biggest challenge, in my view, is how can we continue the support to Ukraine over the autumn and winter into next year? This is the immediate challenge. And we all know that Putin, that the Russian leadership is very closely watching if we are able to maintain our unity and our resolve. And I was really um, glad to see that we had a poll in Germany, uh, I think 10 days ago, which put the question to the German public, despite inflation, despite energy prices, are you in favor of maintaining sanctions and support to Ukraine? And 70% of public opinion in Germany said yes. So we have a, a resolve of the part of the government. We have an excellent coordination also at the level of the European Union. But let me say, um, because we do this here uh, in Birmingham, in the United Kingdom, we have a fantastic cooperation with our British partners, with the Ministry of Defense, uh, with the intelligence community in the UK. We coordinate more or less on a daily basis on our analysis, on our support. And if you have seen some of the deliveries which were made, like the multiple rocket launchers, that was a decision which was taken between the United Kingdom, the US, and Germany jointly. We have done other things like the Hovitzers together with, with the Netherlands. So the big challenge I see here is how can we maintain the support not only with new weapons, but also um, with the maintenance of the things which were delivered, which is a challenge. If you use Hovitzers three, four months, they need to be refurbished. So there is a lot we need to do over the coming phase. But let's not forget that beyond military, there are other aspects which are crucial. Ukraine needs 5 billion euros a month to keep the budget and the country running. We need to be able to support that. We need immediate measures on reconstruction. So Germany is inviting in October, end of October, for a conference where we want to structure the question of at least basic reconstruction of infrastructure. The other issues are humanitarian aid and refugees. So uh, in Germany, we have around one million Ukrainians. We have many which go back and forth but we have a very strong commitment in the European Union, and I see the Polish ambassador. Let me really commend Poland for what you have been doing, not only on the military aid, but also on the, on the humanitarian side and refugees. So our key, and I will end with that, the key issue is maintain the unity of NATO, maintain the unity of the European Union, because Putin is watching out for any weakening of this alliance. And I'm, yeah, I would say not optimistic, but I see maybe a possibility. If Russia is having the defeats they are having on the ground and they see that our resolve is maintained, that hopefully in the coming spring we might be in a situation where we could maybe enter into a kind of a diplomatic process. Because at the end, we need diplomacy to kick in, and this, and I will end with this, is the reason why Chancellor Scholz is maintaining 
Every six, eight weeks, a phone call with Putin. We need to maintain a level of contact which will allow us, when it is needed, to go back into diplomacy. So very briefly, uh, this as my introduction. Great, thank you. So, uh, Ambassador, I, I mean, a lot of people would, you know, were very praising of Germany for their stepping up of uh, military commitments and a real gear shift in that. Um, people were a little bit more critical around energy policy and obviously the reliance that Germany has had on, on uh, imported Russian gas. Do you, is that a fair assessment? Uh, do you think Germany could go further on energy policy or not? Uh, now, I think the, the lesson we have to draw out of that is we need to strengthen our resilience. And resilience in a broad sense. So that was maybe the, the biggest mistake we had, that we had no backup option. And I think looking to China and looking to other challenges, I think what the West, what the NATO, the European Union need to do is we have to look at our resilience for future challenges. Now we have a challenging situation, obviously, like the UK also, but the difference is that we have really to save at least 15, 20% of gas, because if not, we don't have enough for the winter. So we need to save energy, and we have to work on developing and speeding up energy transition. But let me be very clear here. There is no magic solution to the energy crisis, because after the winter in 2023, the situation of LNG in the world will not be better than now. So we need, and we know from Qatar, from Canada, from many others, they need one, two, maybe three years to develop LNG exports. So it means we will have a difficult time till really renewable energy and other means of energy can seriously kick in. So this is and remains a challenge for Germany, but also for the United Kingdom with high prices and effects on our competitiveness, our economic competitiveness. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. So, I mean, it seems that Boris was more popular in Ukraine than he was in this country. Um, so, you know, UK leadership has seemingly has been very good um, in Ukraine. David, over to you. Yeah, although I, I, I've often been critical of Boris Johnson in my time, but I, I, I think on Ukraine he did um, strike exactly the right note. And I just want to sort of make a sort of comments briefly under three headings. I mean, the first is what do we do now as regards Ukraine? And I completely agree with what the ambassador just said, is that Germany, the UK, the West as a whole needs to continue to support Ukraine <laughs> with arms, with training mm -hmm. and with economic support. Mm -hmm. I welcome Germany's decision to convene a conference on uh, economic support, but I think this will call for a high degree of leadership mm -hmm. in all the Western democracies. We should not underestimate the damage that is being done daily to the Ukrainian economy, kind of trying to keep almost the entire male population uh, in, in arms and sort of state of vigilance for military service. The loss of huge amounts of productive capacity in both industry and in uh, agriculture as a result of the Russian aggression. You know, mines being dropped onto uh, grain fields, for example. Um, so this support is going to cost us dear mm -hmm. in the immediate future to keep Ukraine going and using our influence in the global financial institutions to provide uh, bailouts for yeah. Ukraine, but then also for the task of reconstruction that will follow if, as we all hope, that, that we get to the day when Ukraine is able to reclaim its territory and there is a, at least a truce, if not a, 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 a lasting peace of some kind. Um, and just finally on this point, um, I think we need to get smarter again about nuclear deterrence. It's a subject that's dropped off the agenda in the West for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Biden seems, as far as I can tell, to be playing it skillfully at the moment. Uh, but I think all the policymakers of the leading powers in the West need to be thinking about how we make nuclear deterrence work, not only against Putin's Russia, 
but against other potential uh, hostile states in the future and the risk that even non-state actors might get their hands on nuclear technology when that can be transferred at the click of a mouse uh, between continents. Uh, we've seen through the, the, the use of Pakistani nuclear know-how around, uh, uh, around the world and, uh, that this is a genuine risk to our security. Secondly, what is our offer to Russia? I don't see there can be any going back to the previous normal while Putin or anybody like him is in power in the Kremlin. I think that would be too dangerous. Um, but what is there that we can say to Russia in the hope that we can get to a world in which one can deal with Russia as at least a, a normal state, not perhaps a close friend, but, but one with whom we can have do business-like relationships? Um, and I think there we need perhaps to learn the lessons of what went wrong in the 1990s, when if I look back, I don't think that we um, took seriously enough the threat to Yeltsin and the genuine democratic forces that were at work at, at, in Russia then and didn't give them sufficient support and help. Um, but this will be difficult and it will be complicated. But if Ukraine succeeds as a democracy and a free market economy, that will be the most tremendous example to the Russian people next door and is what Putin above all fears. But if, if Ukraine, which so many Russian people see as such close kin to them, is able to make a success of de democracy, the rule of law, human rights, free market economy, then Russian people will start to ask increasingly, well, why shouldn't we have that option for ourselves as well? Finally, um, you asked us um, to, to say a bit, um, Ryan, about um, so future security arrangements in Europe. I think that the importance of NATO and of United States leadership has come through very strongly as a result of this crisis. And I think quite a number of European parties were in danger of forgetting those truths. But we also have to find a way in which NATO, the EU, the UK, the EU member states can work together because the threat is to all of us uh, as democracies committed to human rights and, and the rule of law and democratic institutions. We cannot take for granted that the United States will automatically, under any foreseeable president, uh, regard European security as vital to American national interest. That is something we have to work for. We have to keep selling the case for regarding European security as such to the American people via their elected representatives in the White House and on the Hill. And we have to show that European countries are willing to step up to the plate, both in terms of spending on defence and in terms of exercising political leadership in those parts of the world that may not be such a priority for policymakers in Washington, the Western Balkans, perhaps some parts of the Middle East and North Africa, where the US, now its energy self-sufficient, is, is less interested than it might have been 10 years ago. And NATO has a key role to play, but so does the EU because of its competencies over things like sanctions and trade and finance and governance building initiatives. So I very much welcome the meeting that's going to take place in Prague later this week and our Prime Minister's decision to attend that and welcome the, uh, the, the constructive tone that we've heard from the Foreign Secretary and others about wanting to see better relations uh, between the, the, the uh, other de European democracies and ourselves in the United Kingdom. This is not refighting the battle of um, you know, 2016. It is about, given that decision, how can we as fellow democracies, neighbours, allies, work together to, uh, over to, to overcome a threat to the security of all of us and to every citizen of our countries. So David, I mentioned some criticisms that have been in German policy, particularly on energy policy. For the UK, some of the criticism has been, in terms of the relationship with Russia, that the UK, particularly London, has been the home for very wealthy Russians, often associated with Putin, to invest their money uh, and, you know, the so-called sort of dirty money laundry that uh, London may have become. Do you think there needs to be 
uh, a real shift there as well in terms of clamping down on economic um, crime uh, and and you know is that a sort of part of our kind of weaponry against Russia? Yes, it is part of our weaponry against Russia, and I I, I think that you know, successive British prime ministers have tried. No, perfectly honourably to, to, to see if they could achieve a more constructive relationship. And in their different ways, both David Cameron and Boris Johnson, I can remember being in the room when, with, with each of them in turn saying, uh, I, I think we would surely be able to have a better relationship with Russia and Putin, even if we're going to disagree on a lot, than, than is the case at the moment. And Putin's actions have actually given the lie to those hopes. Um, what this will mean, though, uh, to do it, do it effectively is that we're going to have to find uh, a resource and give a higher priority to the investigators and prosecutors and specialist police teams that you're going to need to track down uh, uh, financial crime and to assemble the evidence trail that will actually stand up in court. Um, so, for example, where um, uh, tools like um, uh, unexplained wealth orders have been used, and they're there on the statute book, um, what the authorities have found is it's been really difficult to, to get the evidence that could meet the criminal threshold of proof when they, they seize it, but then it is, that is challenged uh, uh, in the court subsequently. So I think that there does need to be some hard thinking, not just in the Home Office, but across government, about how you give priority to, 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 to law enforcement in that particular sector. Great. Thank you, David. As you can see, the panel has got even bigger uh, as a sort of record nine strong panel and so welcome to Dr Liam Fox MP uh, and also uh, to Alexei uh, Goncharenko uh, who is a Ukrainian MP uh, and Vice President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of European Committee on uh, Migration. So um, I'm going to ask Evie to come in now and obviously you're a foreign policy expert but you're also the former head of UK youth uh, for the G7 uh, delegate and I'm particularly interested in the sort of generational lens on this in terms of what young people might be thinking about uh, the relations with Russia going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, I think there are two things. Um, I think from a UK perspective in terms of leadership, um, we've got a very strong government that's very clearly wants to take a strong stance on Ukraine. We've seen that consistently from Truss as Foreign Secretary and now as Prime Minister. Um, we've led the way on sanctions. We've led the way on, on, on weapons and military support. Um, and Wallace has supported that as well. I think there are a few challenges, and one of them is domestic consent. Um, from a young, I think from a young person's perspective, it's no different perhaps that, than old generations. We, we care about um, the international sphere. But I do think there's a, there's a danger, and I'm sorry to, to, to go opposite to what you said. I think I'm a little bit more pessimistic um, about domestic consent for interaction with Ukraine long term. I think we've seen high mm. levels of support so far, and I think mm. that will maintain. But um, you know, recent polling has shown us that in the UK, at least, um, while 54% supported shank sanctions, regardless of whether it increased cost of living for them in March, by now it's now down to 43%. So we're seeing that those numbers are decreasing as as mm. the harsh winter bites and the cost of living crisis hits. <coughs> I think there's a danger that in the coming months we will really need to galvanise that support. I think. People still care about Ukraine, and they always will, but they will also always focus on the domestic. And so in sort of focus groups and things that I've done, we've seen that trend again, where if you ever ask Britons to, uh, to talk about threats, they will always talk about the domestic, the local threats. They'll talk about knife crime, street crime, the things around them, and they won't see those big international issues once they've come out of the limelight. Ukraine is obviously still in the limelight, but not quite to the same extent as it was a few months ago. And I think there's a danger there on maintaining public consent at a time of quite a lot of political and economic turbulence in the UK. Um, I also think that we've got many other challenges coming. Um, I think before the Ukraine crisis, we were talking a lot about China and we've sort of stopped talking about China because we only have so much vision and so much we can focus on at once. That is still going on. The Indo Pacific still, the Indo Pacific still remains important and there's more we will need to do in that area um, moving forwards. Um, the other one, and I think again for young people, is the, the big one is climate change. Um, the UK last year, it was our, our big grandstanding uh, message was that we cared about climate change. We were the world leaders on climate change. We, we ran COP26. It was an amazing success in many ways. And then inevitably, the energy crisis has pushed that down the agenda. That was inevitable. Um, people will always focus close to home. 
But ultimately, that, that crisis hasn't gone away. You've got COP27 coming up around the corner, and inevitably de developing nations particularly are going to be pushing us hard on our climate commitments. So we'll have to balance how we relate with those nations who might otherwise go to China for support if we are not seen to be leading on climate change. Um, we'll have that issue to address. And then the third one, I think, is, and I think there are some exciting opportunities, as we mentioned, the meeting in Prague, um, but I think the UK still hasn't worked out fully its position in the world post-Brexit and how we work with our allies moving forward. And actually, when we talk about so defence spending, for example, it's always a point of antagonism. There's always a bit of, oh, they're not doing enough, they're not doing enough, tittle-tattle on the other. And actually building those constructive relationships moving forward will be really, really important. Mm -hmm. And until we can do that, we're not going to give as concrete a response on Ukraine um, as I think we'd like. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Evie. <laughs> okay, so good to have a German perspective, a UK perspective, uh, a kind of young person's perspective. I, I think now let's go to an EU perspective. So, Ambassador, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry for the, the panel dictatorship in this, in, the, <laughs> in this event, but I'll try to minimize, the, my, minimize that. You, you, you give me five minutes, I'd like to make three plus two points, if I may. <laughs> so that means one minute per each. Uh, now, the, I think the main, the main point I'd like to make is expanding a little bit on what Miguel said, and of course I fully subscribe to everything he said. Um, you know, when you're dealing with Ukraine and Russia, you are first and foremost dealing about Europe. Not only, but first and foremost about Europe. It's the theater of operations, it's the natural mm -hmm. uh, common ground for, for Ukraine, for Russia, and for us. And there's one thing you cannot change, and that's geography. And so we'll be living with Ukraine and Russia for the foreseeable future. So uh, for us, European Union, critically important. And sometimes in our lives and in the lives of countries and in the life of the European Union as well, you need a, an external factor to trigger the best in you. And I think this is a good illustration of this. Putin managed to produce the best in terms of European Union reaction. And as a long-term serving European official and diplomat, I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. What we were able to do in support of Ukraine, in sanctioning Russia, is absolutely unprecedented. We added another element, which I think is very important, and I'd like to underline here, is that we cannot do this alone. Neither Ukraine, obviously, nor the European Union, nor the United Kingdom. We need an international coalition. We need the international community to realize that the threat by Putin is not only a threat to Ukraine, to the European Union, to NATO, is a threat to the global values mm -hmm. of the rule of law, international order. But also, you know, any country has a bigger neighbor. If we allow in Europe the bigger neighbor to do what Putin wants to do, we are giving a green light to all the bigger neighbors around the world. So this should be a concern for every country mm -hmm. around the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we still have not won that narrative battle. Right. We need to do more on that front. So uh, for us, critically important to provide Ukraine with a European perspective. And I would like us not to underestimate the decision we took to have Ukraine as an accession country, as a candidate country. This is an historical decision. Mm -hmm. If you had asked me a year ago, is this possible in your lifetime, maybe I would have doubts. I hope my lifetime will still be very long, but <laughs> even in that framework, it was not obvious a year ago that we would take this decision. We took the decision unanimously, and we are go going forward with that. This is uh, the most important politically decision that a politically speaking decision that we took, and I, I don't want this to be underestimated. Secondly, what we are doing in a more creative way outside the European Union, and I also praise the decision by the Prime Minister to go to Prague. Uh, I think it's a wise decision. I think it goes in the right direction of strengthening not only uh, the UK role in continental Europe, but also the relationship between the UK 
and the members of the European Union and the European Union itself. I think we live in the same region, we share the same challenges, we need to act together. So, what do we need to do and what are we ready to do? On the short term, we have to win the battle of winter. And the battle of winter is as much on the battleground as it is in our own domestic public opinion spaces. Mm -hmm. We cannot lose our voters in, in their willingness to support the effort uh, in support of Ukraine and in sanctioning uh, Russia. We need to show resilience throughout the short term, the winter that comes, and we need to continue to have unity of purpose, certainly within the EU, and I can guarantee you that the case, but also beyond the EU, as we have discussed. Now, on the long term, the problems will not be solved on the 21st of March when winter ends. Uh, the problems will remain on the number of levels. Security-wise, energy-wise, public opinion-wise. So we need to address those issues, continue to address those issues. Uh, points were made here about, about NATO, about the US, about what some call the strategic autonomy of the, Union, of the European Union. I do not necessarily like that expression, but it, it, it reveals the discussion that is taking place about Europe being able to be a bigger security provider, Europe being able to provide itself with the means of its political ambitions, and Europe being able to be inside NATO and with our partners, including the UK, a more reliable or more effective Mm -hmm. player. And I think this is part of the long-term strategy. Final point on the EU-UK, because that's my line of business. Uh, <laughs> I think what we've seen since the, the beginning of the war is, again, the best in us. In the last few years, I've seen maybe the worst in us in terms of bilateral relations. I leave that beside, to the side. But what we've done since, since uh, February for me, means two things. First, that we have common challenges, and we cannot afford to consider that your problem is your problem, not mine. This is, these are our problems. And secondly, that we have the capacity, when we, we wish to do so, to act together and to work together. I think we should, I'm sure we are, and the last few days, I'm, I'm more encouraged than, than before, we should be inspired by what we have done in these few months more than by what we have not done in the last few years. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I've got lots of questions, but I'm conscious of time, and I don't want to hog all the questions. So I think we'll go now to perhaps the most important voice, which is the Ukrainian voice. So, Alexei, over to you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. I hope that you hear me. Um, First of all, it's a big honor to be here. Thank you for your invitation and very important topic. I just want to start m my thoughts about it with, I spoke with my younger son, he's four years old, just several hours ago. Uh, he's in Odessa, my native city. And he said to me, he's so happy, he said, Dad, we saw how Russian drone was shot down. And that is our reality. And first of all, I, I just want all of you to remember this. When we are speaking about winter bills and all this, I don't want your children to call you saying that they see how something is intercepted or shut down in your city. And uh, that's first thing. And it's much more important, security first. And second, what was this drone? It was Iranian drone. Mm -hmm. Shahid, they call it. And that's about the war. It's not just Russian-Ukrainian war. It's a really war of free world against not free world. And they are also uniting. So the only way for us to win this war is to be united in the free world. And to be united in our actions, but also to be united on the platforms, which is very important. We are very thankful for the decision of, of uh, providing Ukraine candidacy to European Union. That was. I was in German Ministry of Foreign Affairs 10 days before uh, a decision was made. And I should tell you, there was no final decision at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
And that was made just in the last days, and it was very important. I mean, we appreciate it very much, and we are very thankful for this step. But I want us to continue to make next steps, and next step is NATO. This is the platform where all free world is united, almost all, yeah, but much bigger than European Union. For example, United Kingdom is, and, uh, and many other countries. And we should move ahead. And Ukraine now made an application. And we are today fighting for NATO. We are the shield of NATO. We are the sword of NATO today. And uh, I think uh, we, should, we should say the truth that it is the fact. It is already de facto. Let's make it de jure. And I don't see any other guarantees of security on the continent. No other things, um, you know, Russia, you remember Budapest Memorandum, other things, they just simply didn't work. Let's make lessons. I don't want to say who was right or who made mistakes. Germany made mistakes, we made our mistakes, and everybody, it's normal. But the difference is, do we make lessons from our mistakes? And I think that what, there was a mistake to try to build security in Europe, having Ukraine as a buffer mm. between Europe and Russia. And that was a mistake. And today, let's make a lesson of it and to, comp to finish this story. And let's take Ukraine to NATO, make this courageous decision. <clears throat> and that is what I want to ask uh, all of you. Just be brave like Ukraine, because we don't have any other option. That's not because we are the bravest nation in the world, no. We don't have any other option. For us, it's existential, to be or not to be. So that's why we are fighting. We will continue to fight. We will definitely win together with your support. But let us be brave. And the, the, the last but not the least, dear Germany, gives a, give us tanks. <laughs> that is like more important Make than a everything. Call to everybody. Yeah. Also to the UK. Yeah. <laughs> today, today one leopard means much more than one hundred thousand words. So that is like, uh, for us, it's so important. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very important to have you here, and, and you're very welcome. And uh, thank you for that. Um, and I think what you said, that you being the shield of NATO, is something that we'd uh, all agree with. Um, so thank you. Um, Gunter. To you. OK. Gunter. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, thank you to, um, to have the chance to give a few remarks. Maybe one remark to the last remark of our Ukrainian friend. I think he deserves a, 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 a correct and, and immediate answer. I'm, I'm very much in favor, as my party is, uh, to add to this many weapons that we already delivered, uh, even more weapons. Also, tanks should not be ruled out. I think it would be probably, as amazing says, as, a, as an opposition politician, be easier for the German present government to do it if a few other countries would also deliver uh, some tanks. If we would do it together, if Great Britain says also we're delivering some of our tanks, even if they're not maybe not as useful as the ones that we could deliver, I think the German government would have a positive incentive, don't say talking about pressure, but a positive incentive um, to go ahead and, and, and to do it also, so that might be a good, a good way to do it. But since we all have um, five minutes each, and uh, I think in the speaker's briefing there were 10 questions that should be covered in the, in the whole discussion at least, I would focus on the justice part in our title, mm -hmm. European justice and security. So if it's about security, it always also we have to talk, should talk about justice. We have to fight with weapons, but also with legal means. Um, it's um, often said that it's not only about the independence of Ukraine, this war, but also about democracy, but also rule of law. Certainly the rule of law system, the legal system in Ukraine was not perfect before the war, but it was going better year by year, and the Russian system was going worse year by year. And that's mm -hmm. certainly one incentive also of Putin, to, um, that he, he cannot like a country of, of a brother people, as he calls it, right next door, with a working democracy, at least working better year by year, I would say, not perfect, with a, a rule of law, with a legal system working better by the year. But there's a third aspect, or a second aspect to the, to the part of, of the rule of law system. It's also about the international legal system. Um, this International law has been broken by atrocities of the Russian soldiers. It has been broken by the very annexation of Crimea and other parts in eastern, uh, in eastern Ukraine. But we also should focus for a moment, and I, I um, hope I have the chance to, or you forgive me, to make a quick historical reference about the very idea 
that law of aggression, uh, or that, that, that an aggression, that a, that a active war, to start a war, is pro prohibited under international law. Mm -hmm. And this only started with the Kellogg-Briand Pact 100 years ago. It was really a few years after um, the, um, uh, the Versailles Treaty. And then when it became quickly part of this treaty and also quickly part of customary international law, a few years later, Japan invaded parts of China in the 19, 1935. Italy fought a war against Abyssinia, Ethiopia. And that led the defenders of the German government, of the German war criminals, I have to say, in Nuremberg, for example, to the argument, this is not really a valid law. The law of aggression to, uh, that, uh, that aggressive war is prohibited may be part of some, con uh, some treaties, but it's not really a valid part of international law because it was breached. And the point they had was that there was no meaningful international reaction to this, um, uh, to this uh, uh, breaking of this, of this legal principle. So this time we have to make it better. We have to make sure that it's not accepted, that it's not um, 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 that we don't have only half-hearted reaction to this um, um, uh, to breach, to the severe breach of this law, certainly the most severe breach of international law, of a major principle of, principle of international law after the Second World War. And it's not just one principle that aggression, that a, a war is prohibited, is, I think, at the core of our international order. If we have an international order that's there in normal times, but everybody can break it by just starting a war, do we really still have an international order? I would say that we then would still have, is not, could really not rightfully be called an international order. So it's certainly about rule of law in, um, in, in Ukraine. It's about the um, uh, democracy, but it's also of, of, about the international um, rule of law, the international legal order. And that's also one major reason why we have to be strong and have to be clear on this. There are three areas as I said, of international law that can be, uh, can be broken and the humanitarian atrocities that we witness and have to witness almost by the week now that uh, Ukraine is, is able to um, regain territory. There we have legal answers, also answers in terms of court systems. We have um, the international court, we have especially the international criminal court, we have even national prosecutors, national courts, the Germans, um, uh, British, some others, I think almost 10 in the European uh, Union, that instigated proceedings that can also bring individual war criminals um, to a court. But what happens with the very leaders of Russia, with Putin and the people, the ministers and the military senior leaders, it's very hard to really establish a causality up the way up to the whole um, command, uh, chain of command. And there we don't really have a good answer. It's a, it's a prohibition, it's even a war crime, but we cannot prosecute it un under the International uh, Criminal Court. So we need a special tribunal, as your foreign minister has, uh, has asked for. And there were also major uh, British voices on this. And I think my own government, but also many other European governments, have to come out stronger in support of an international special tribunal, really to also start proceedings against the very top. Because in Germany, we have, I can't translate it, a, a bad proverb saying, um, you, you hang the small people. Um, but, but the bigger ones you just let go. And we should not send this message also not to people in Ukraine and other parts of, of Europe that um, we can uh, not reach the top of, of government. And so therefore, um, we could th do three things. My last uh, remark in a situation like this. We could look the other way, and I think I made it clear that it would not be a good idea for us, for Ukrainians, for the international order, just to look the other way under this Russian aggression. The classical solution, maybe 100, 150 years ago, would be Germany, Great Britain, other countries would be active um, partic uh, participations, uh, we do, do, would participate in this war actively. There are also major downsides of this. The legal right would be there, and the international law, we would have the perfect right to be part of, of, of this war effort di directly. But I think the third approach is right, to do weapon delivery, um, to use sanctions, also now to help Ukraine or to, to do together with Ukraine to establish a sanctions me mechanism. I don't think that the German taxpayer mainly should pay for the rebuilding of Ukraine, but Russians, the Russian government, but maybe also Russian individuals should pay in the end for this, um, uh, for this building up. And also, as I said, we have to use legal proceedings, and I made my remark to this point. And the very last sentence, I would say, whatever we would do, we have to do it with consequence and strongly because half-hearted support only prolongs this war which Ukraine has to win. Thank you. Thank you, Gunter. Uh, 
Liam, thoughts from you? Well, it's interesting to have a debate about Russia sitting as part of the Politburo here um, <laughs> uh, at the front. Um, I, I think there are a number of areas where we have to think about our response. The first is political. And um, we need to understand that we need to ditch our tendency to uh, substitute wishful thinking instead of critical analysis. Way back at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, Putin set mm -hmm. out his very distorted worldview. And it was poo-hooed at the time, um, and many people just did not take it seriously. The next year, he was in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And we still chose to believe that what he told us wasn't true. And then, having gone there, we next got Crimea, 2014. And still, we did very little, because we still had this element of, well, let's not have too much economic disruption, and let, let's believe that the uh, intent is perhaps not there for any further expansion. Now we are where we are. Now we've responded, but we've responded very late in the day. Mm -hmm. And I say that not to, in any way, attribute guilt to any of us who were part <coughs> of that process, but we've got to break it because we're doing it again elsewhere. We've got, in China, to stop wishful thinking, replacing critical analysis, and even closer to home, in the Balkans. It is the great um, uh, unviewed potential conflict at the present time. Yeah. We are not taking seriously enough uh, Russian and Chinese arms pouring into Serbia and the potential for another war in the Balkans. We have got to be very much on top of that. You can't choose how many conflicts you're trying to deal with or prevent. You've got to deal with them as reality presents them. The second is that we have to strengthen our doctrine on deterrence because we've allowed deterrence doctrine to become very much focused on nuclear deterrence and not in its wider concept. And we've got to, to strengthen that. We've got to talk about it. It's got to be part of uh, very much of what NATO um, is all about. Then we've got to have the practical capabilities to carry out uh, those elements of policy that we want to have. That means raising our defence budgets. We've been talking about this for a very long time. I remember when I was Defence Secretary, Robert Gates and I used to have what we call called bad cop and worse cop, um, which was to, to berate everyone over the, the size of the defence budgets. Um, but it's not just the size of the budgets, it's what we spend the budgets on and how we coordinate within NATO so that we're not duplicating and wasting resources, but we're actually adding to our total value uh, as an alliance. And we need to remember within that the sheer dominance of the United States. People forget that the United States defense budget is bigger than the next nine mm. put together in the world. It's bigger than China, plus Russia, plus Britain, plus France, plus India, plus Germany, plus Saudi Arabia, plus Japan, plus South Korea. Um, that is not a bad uh, ally to have <laughs> alongside China <laughs> in all of this. Uh, and I think that we need to understand and the importance of the United States yeah. within that. Yeah. But in doing so, recognize that you cannot expect the American taxpayer to indefinitely yeah. carry the burden of exactly. European defense to the extent that mm. they're doing at the present time. And it's a political as well as a military uh, exercise raising those defense budgets. Then I think we have to, as the argument has been made very eloquently already, make this an argument about values. It's not just about territory. Uh, it's not just about economics. It's about the values that we have. And we were much better in the Cold War at being willing to stand up and say, mm -hmm. our view of the world is not just different from the Soviet Union. It's better than the Soviet Union because democracy is better than totalitarianism. A rule of law is better than arbitrary law. We've got to start to get back to making these basic arguments about why we are who we are and why our values are what they are. And finally, I would just say I entirely agree with Gunter about the question of, of justice. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people saying, well, sanctions can't be lifted on the Russian leadership, Putin and others, until they withdraw completely from Ukraine. I disagree. Sanctions can never be lifted on people like Putin because of what they have already done. They don't get excused mm -hmm. by any future actions that they may take. And if we can get prosecutions, then we should try to get prosecutions. Um, international law is nothing if it cannot be enforced ever. And we must find mechanisms to, to do that. So in all these areas, political, military, cooperation, and justice, all these levers need to be able to work. Um, because 
And we need to ensure that there's a connection between the decisions we take and the effects that we're able to have. Um, too often in politics, we pull levers, uh, or we think we're pulling levers. In fact, we're pushing string. And we need to make sure that there's a much better connection in mm. all of these areas mm. than I'm afraid uh, as a collective we've had in recent years. Thank you. Very good. You mentioned, Liam, uh, that we carried on as usual after Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. What, would, what do you think we should have done differently? We should have been looking at the sort of sanctions package that we had this time, but yeah. earlier. It is part of the same deterrence. Economic deterrence has a role to play just as military deterrence does. Uh, we, we, were, we acted too little too late. I mean, it's, it, that's not to beat ourselves up, but it's a lesson we should be learning for mm. the future. Again, as I say, when we're looking at what's happening in Serbia, when we're looking at what's happening in China, uh, we'd be better to learn the lessons um, of the past before we repeat the same mistakes. Great, thank you. May I add to your question? Yes. Anna? Yeah. I think that it was a big mistake to then to rely on Russia as a partner, for example, in an energy source after 2014. And I think we should say that clean energy is energy from clean countries. <laughs> and that is something which should be said loudly because uh, we can rely on one another in the free world. We can't rely on di tyrants, dictators, and their states. In this case, we are dependent. When we are dependent, we are weak. That's what we received in the result in 2022. Clean energy comes from clean countries. I like that. Um, right, let's have questions and contributions um, from the floor. If you could say who you are and where you're from. And please do wait for the microphone, because we've got people watching on the live stream. Uh, so we'll start with this gentleman here, just in front. Uh, Simon Delat from West Suffolk Conservatives. Could I just a couple of quick points, and I'll make it swift to the German ambassador. Um, you speak about diplomacy, and absolutely applaud that, and we need to do it. I just want to be clear, diplomacy starts when Russia has completely withdrawn to the 2014 borders, and not a minute sooner. And the second, I have to say, is why won't you send them tanks? Okay. Why won't you, sorry, why won't you send Ukrainian the tanks they desperately need? Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take uh, some more questions and contributions. So uh, we've got uh, this gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you. James Poland from uh, Leicestershire uh, County Council and John Borough Council. Um, the situation in Ukraine is uh, the, the most dangerous situation, certainly in my lifetime, and I suspect any time since the Second World War. Um, the annexation, obviously, the, the so-called annexation of, of parts of Ukrainian sovereign territory, I think, has only made it more dangerous given the Russian um, uh, rules of engagement vis-à-vis -vis nuclear weapons. How, what, how dangerous do you think? Do you think there's a realistic prospect that tactical nuclear weapons could be used in this conflict? And if that's the case, what should the free world's uh, response be? And could there ever be a situation where we get involved directly? Great, thank you. Uh, and then there was a gentleman here. Um, if we could take his question. Thank you. I Ivan Murray Smith from the Great Arm of Conservatives. This is a, a question really for the panel. Russia has hundreds of billions of dollars, euros, pounds deposited in the central banks around the Western world and also hundreds of millions of dollars worth of gold, for example, with the Federal Reserve. We know that Ukraine is paying a huge cost in terms of the war and will have huge reconstruction costs. Is there a case that those assets, rather than simply being seized, should be used to support both the war in Ukraine and the post-war reconstruction? Thank you. Great, thank you. Great questions. Um, so, uh, Miguel, perhaps I'll come to you on the issue of why won't you send them tanks? Yeah, maybe I'll start before that with diplomacy. Um, I mean, we have said repeatedly that in the end, it's the Ukrainian government who has to decide under which conditions we go back to diplomacy and when the basis is laid to go back to diplomacy. So if that includes a total withdrawal or not, I would leave that open. But the point is obviously that our sanctions are going to continue as long as Ukrainian territory is, is occupied. I think that has to be definitely the baseline. 
On the tanks, I think this is really a decision very high up for the heads of state and government. And what I take from the German debate is <coughs> that the focus is very much on the German Leopard. Nobody speaks about the American Abram tanks. You don't see any American tank in Ukraine. You don't see a British tank. What about the Challengers? What about the French Leclerc? So if such a measure is taken into account, I think it needs to be done in a very coordinated way and thinking through what the political implications of such a step in the current setup will be. So our focus for the time being is artillery, where we have delivered a lot. Defense minister was just in Odessa. Mm -hmm and air defense. We are sending the most modern air defense system, which even the Bundeswehr does not have. This is the IRIS-T. The first one is coming. There will be four systems till January. So we are focusing on that. OK. Uh, and Liam, perhaps I'll come to you on this issue around tanks and, and what the ambassadors just raised. I mean, can, do you think there should be that sort of coordination to, to provide tanks in Ukraine? I think it's up to the Ukrainian government to determine and request what it is that they think that they want um, from any particular government, um, rather than becoming a wider diplomatic uh, game of uh, uh, evading uh, responsibility because there are political difficulties involved. But I, I don't really want to get involved with that. I think that the, the much more serious question is, was, was the other question um, about, about Russia using a tactical mm -hmm. nuclear weapon. Yeah. Uh, I think, again, uh, it really disturbs me when I read people saying that he's bluffing, he may be bluffing, but as long as there's a chance that he's not bluffing, we have to have a very clear idea of what our response would be. And I know that the, the White House and the Kremlin will be regularly communicating, mm -hmm. yeah. that the White House will be saying to Russia unequivocally, this will be our response if you use a tactical nuclear weapon, and the United States has to take a lead on this, given uh, its size and the importance uh, of its, its military capability. Uh, uh, people will have read what uh, General Petraeus said a couple of days ago uh, as a former head of the, the CIA and given his military experience, um, uh, he will be very conscious of the messages that will be delivered by his public utterances. Um, but I think it gets into just slightly dicey territory if we start to make amateur predictions uh, of what those uh, ultimata are being made privately by the United States. This is a very, very a dangerous situation mm. uh, in which we find ourselves. And that my, my own view is that should you try to do so, you're likely to see some test somewhere. Um, you're likely to see then a further escalation in the political tension, then potentially the use in an uninhabited area, uh, again, as a, an attempt to further raise the tension. Um, and, and I think this is a very testing time for us, probably the most dangerous time yeah. since the Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. uh, that we've faced. Mm -hmm. Alexi. I just, that every word is absolutely right. First of all, we'll be happy to all tanks. And uh, yeah, but uh, sure, like every country has different possibilities. And speaking about the United States, I, I should be <coughs> thankful and I should say, there is no here representative of US, but without US military support, we would not survive. So that is, uh, they did and they gave so many. Yes, we have also questions why we have high Marses and MLRS, thanks to Germany too, a Mars system, mm -hmm. but we don't have long range missiles. Mm -hmm. I can't understand why we can have 70 kilometers missiles and we can't have 300 kilometers missiles. Nobody can explain us this. So we have these questions, but in general, we're very thankful. We hope that will be continued. And I just want to add two words about nukes. Uh, I just, I don't want to threaten anybody, but from Ukrainian perspective, being inside, we are moving this way. Uh, it doesn't mean that it will be definitely an attack, but unfortunately on every crossroad possible, Putin chooses the worst possible way. And by continuing this track, we are moving to this end. So uh, that is why I think we should react today and it should be said very clearly what will be the consequences for Russia. That should be militarily. Russia will not, if Putin will be so desperate to go to this, it will mean he doesn't bother anymore about any sanctions. So sh sanctions will not change this. 
that uh, being just pariah for him better to be a life pariah mm -hmm. than to lie in mausoleum you know so that is why he uh, we are should be we should have these discussions in the governments we should think about what will be reaction uk is the very right place to speak about it because uk us and france are nuclear powers and one more thing UK and US gave Ukraine guarantees in 1994 when we gave up our nuclear weaponry, the third biggest in the world. And to threaten Ukraine with nukes is triple cynical, triple. And the last thing, uh, which is very important, it's not about Ukraine. If Putin will do one of the steps that uh, Lyon said, absolutely rightly, trial, pressure, that will mean the end of uh, non-proliferation policy in the world. That will be dead. And in 20 years, we will have 50 countries in the world with nukes. Because everybody will know, if you want to have security, have your own nukes. When they will have it in Asia, in Latin America, in all the possible continent, that will sooner or later end in a big nuclear war. So that is so important, not just about our continent, not just about this war, but about future of our civilization. Do we have this future or not? This is a very big question today. So I think that was very rightly arising, and that should be discussed. And the last thing, diplomacy. You said about diplomacy. I also think that China should be involved here. Mm -hmm. I don't think China will benefit from any nuclear conflict. And that is important to involve China and India in this co communication with Russia to show them the consequences. But it should be from both hands. One hand that, re yes, you will be complete pariah. China, India, all will cut any relationships with you. But the second hand should be military. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And David, just uh, perhaps you can answer this point around assets, um, which was mentioned mm. by the chap, Great Yarmouth Conservatives. I can add something to it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, go on to first. Good. Go for it. Yeah. I think it's it's not easy to do to um, to use the the, the 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 deposits of the central bank, but it can be done. I think we have to establish a, a compensation mechanism. The Minister of, of, of Justice of Ukraine visited our uh, Legal Affairs Committee, and we talked about this. It's now a big priority, rightfully, of the Ukrainian government to use this. Maybe even under some circumstances we couldn't use private, private funds, the ones of the oligarchs that we just now freeze. But I think we should also see how we can go further. This was also done, I don't want to compare it really, but to other like citizens of Germany in the Second World War. So there are some um, precedents to it, and we should, um, and we, uh, we should use it. It's, it's much better than just to use it, our taxpayers' money in our country. It's maybe one word about um, the idea of that the whole territory has to be back under Ukrainian control before peace talks start. The international law is certainly in favor of this because an international treaty is void if it's done under pressure. And if part of your territory is unrightfully under the control of a different country, a treaty cannot be done under international law. There might be some exceptions if the Security Council steps in and so on. So this is not really a arbitrary or just a political position of the Ukrainian government, or of us, hopefully, but it also has the support of the very principle of international law that you can't just do a treaty if one of the parties to the treaty is under pressure, is, is, is pressured and threatened by another country. Great. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take another round of questions and comments. So uh, this will be the final round. So if you're keen to ask something or say something, please put up your hand. So we'll start with this gentleman here. If you could wait for the microphone. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I just, Jeremy Bennett from Oxford University. I'd just like to, um, I think, echo the point made by Liam Fox, I think, uh, primarily. I, d I do think um, it is absolutely vital that we look at European defense spending. Um, our reliance on the Americans, I've just come back from America, this assumption that the great US taxpayer will always come to our rescue is just not something we can rely on forever. Um, it's not the end of our great alliance across the states, but it's it, it, our GDP, the European Union GDP is equal to the United States, and we forget this. And yet the defense spending is just multiple multiples, and it's not sustainable. And in a crisis like this, if European governments cannot address that point, or at least move a long way in that direction, very rapidly, I really, really fear for the order that we're all defending. Great. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Uh, this gentleman here, if we could wait for the microphone. Thank you. Um, I think it's quite clear that uh, Putin has weaponized energy, but it's been energy in the form of gas. 
I am very concerned about weaponizing energy in the form of nuclear power. Russia is a major exporter of nuclear power stations. I believe they've exported something at least 25. And not only that, once they're in place, they need nuclear fuel. And the nuclear fuel comes from Russia. I wish you guys would actually pay a bit more attention to this. It's a threat. Great. And without sounding rude, do you mind just saying who you are? Sorry, my name is David Dundas. I'm an energy consultant. Great, thank you. Uh, and then this gentleman here. Good afternoon. My name is Martin uh, from Portugal. Uh, I'd like to put a question regarding the, uh, do you think the blatant violation of the Budapest Memorandum puts into jeopardy the entire liberal world-based, uh, rules-based order? Thank you very much. Great. Any final thoughts or comments people wanted to, to give? Okay, great. So I'm going to ask the panelists to respond to one or uh, any of those um, contributions and then give final remarks. So we'll start with Evie. Um, I, I think I'd really just like to echo the point about um, the reliance on US taxpayers. Um, I think NATO is in jeopardy in that the United States will increasingly look to the Indo-Pacific. That is inevitable. It's where it sees its immediate threats beside Russia. Um, and there's a very real reason that the U UK and its European partners need to be investing heavily in NATO and in their own defence spending. And that's not just putting big blanket statements saying, oh, we'll give you 100 billion here, we're doing this on defence, but what that actually concretely look like, could, looks like underneath, not just attributing previous projects to new spending, that, that's, not the, that's not actually any additional money. We're seeing quite a lot of governments doing that sort of thing um, and working together. I think this is the crucial thing is that even on this panel, I know we're all kind of aiming in the, in the same direction, we're all incredibly supportive of Ukraine. You do see the tensions between the different nations on how that short support should be delivered and who is and who isn't doing enough. That infighting ultimately isn't hugely constructive. Um, we all have our own, you know, constituencies, I say that, I don't, but to represent here, um, who have their own backing in, and that affects the way you can act ultimately. But ult the, uh, the long story is, Long shots, long story start. We're all aiming to the same thing. And I think fighting over who hasn't done this and who has done that is not going to be constructive in creating cohesive uh, approach to NATO. Okay. David? Um, just on the last, last question, quickly, I, I think that the biggest penalty that's being paid for the flouting of the Budapest Memorandum is that that was a treaty under which Ukraine agreed to give up its nuclear weapons although the old Soviet stocks held on mm -hmm. Ukrainian soil in return for security guarantees. So the message that's gone out to everybody around the world um, is, um, you know, if you give up your nuclear weapons, you can't rely on the treaty to protect you. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we better hang on to the nukes or try and get some if we haven't got any. And I, th I think that is profoundly dangerous. Very quickly on Jeremy's question, um, I think that I'm absolutely in favour of saying that there needs to be greater European defence spending but that has to go alongside a greater willingness to exercise political leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, I can remember you know, with some of the, the African um, mm -hmm. uh, CSDP missions, um, the councils voted in favour of initiative to go ahead. And then when they've gone, gone round trying to get together uh, contingents of troops from particular countries, um, they've run into all sorts of difficulties. And I, I think that um, that's something, I, think, I do think the EU needs to raise its game. I also think that's another reason why, in my view, we need to develop a new, different, close strategic partnership between the UK and the countries of the European Union, because mm -hmm. I, I think that can, compl can complement NATO mm -hmm. as long as it doesn't duplicate it. Mm -hmm. Great. EU ambassador. Yeah, uh, uh, along the same, the, the, the same lines. Um, I've been watching the debate in this country about what Europe is doing, particularly since 2016, uh, to reinforce its, its defense, security, foreign policy capabilities. And one area, one line of this debate is to say, whatever the EU does on that weakens NATO. And that's, that is a, a debate that has been going on, which I think is the wrong one. Yeah. The wrong one. Uh, we now have, uh, you know, virtually all the European Union countries, with the exception of three neutral countries, or for other reasons, don't want to join in NATO. So, the overlapping is quite, is quite substantial in terms of, of membership. So whatever the, the EU countries as such individually, or as EU, as we're doing since 
a, a couple of years now. Whatever we do on that front to reinforce capabilities, this is reinforcing NATO. This is not weakening NATO. This is our way uh, to enable us to be a better partner of the United States, not a worse partner of the United States. So I would like uh, this line of argument uh, to be put aside and people to consider that whatever we are doing to reinforce our capabilities as the EU or as individual countries of the EU is good for NATO, ultimately. It's not against the interest of NATO. Second point, uh, I often see, uh, and when I was posted in the US, that was exactly the same, a very narrow concept of uh, defense capabilities or uh, reinforcing our action on defense. You know, it's not only about defense spending, particularly if defense spending is buying F-35s. It's more than that. It's what we do to create security conditions in Europe. Enlargement is part of creating security conditions. Membership of the European <coughs> Union mm -hmm. with economic development, prosperity, uh, rule of law, all that is part of creating security conditions in Europe. And, and defense capabilities is not only about spending, it's about the way you spend, the way you spend. And what we have in Europe is that we are spending not in the most efficient way, for mm -hmm. reasons we all know. So it's about the industrial dimension, it's about the research dimension, it's about the link between industry and research uh, in, in the defense area, it's about procurement, big debate. So all of these elements, it's, it's more than the 2%, let's be clear. It's mm -hmm. more than the 2%. Great, thank you. And then I think Liam needs to get, I don't know if you want to say any final words or you have to sh shoot off. Uh, very quickly, first of all, mm. David's point, um, we have neglected energy security in this country for a very long time. It's not as though there haven't been ample warnings. When we set up the mm. National Security Council in yes. 2010, one of the things that we're supposed to look at was the wider security mm. picture, including energy security. Um, it's much better if we can reduce our dependence on imported energy, but let's be very frank, we're going to be uh, re required to import fossil fuels for a long number of years yet. Much better we can get it from our friends um, mm. and choose our friends wisely. And in our case, thank God for Norway. Um, <laughs> the, uh, when it comes to defence, of course we must re increase defence spending, but we've got to spend it well. And once we've spent it, we've got to be willing to use it. Mm -hmm. We can't have armed forces mm. that are museum pieces. We have to be willing to co operate with our allies when required and accept our responsibility in that. And finally, my first point, uh, you need critical analysis, not wishful thinking. You can get as many dictators as you like to sign treaties, but what are they going to be worth? The Budapest Memorandum was there because Russia said in return for Ukraine giving up its nuclear weapons, they would guarantee its security. Well, you know, what a joke, a, a, pretty, a pretty disgusting joke that's turned out to be. But remember what China have done over the treaty with Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's be realistic about just what you can get from dictatorships mm -hmm. when it comes to guarantees. Uh, always much better to get them from other democratic nations who, who understand the concept of rule of law, including international law. Uh, and let's not fool ourselves with uh, security guarantees which exist only on paper. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liam. Gunter, you, are, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you ask a, a direct question, direct answer. Yes, the international order is at stake, as I try to uh, point out. It's at least as much a European order as maybe even more a European order as an American order. And that's why it's clear that we have to invest in its preservation. That means now supporting Ukraine, but also in the longer term, um, build up also our military capacities. That also implies overcoming, I dare to say this, a sometimes rather romantic wishful thinking in our societies that everything is fine and we are just around it by, by friends. It's unfortunately not the case if it ever was anymore. Uh, we also have to make our societies and our economies, energy is a crucial part, resilient. And um, doing this, we should cooperate also across and beyond the European Union, especially UK has to be an important partner in this. And we should not look behind, but more look ahead and to maybe close with a sentence of Konrad Adenauer, it's never too late, too late for a new beginning. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and Ambassador, quickly, uh, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, first of all, on, on Rosatom and, and their exports, uh, very important point. I think the problem why this has not been sanctioned is because many important countries from Korea to Turkey, even two member states of the European Union, have nuclear power plants which were developed together with Russia. So by stopping and sanctioning, we would stop the energy supply in, in, in these countries. I think this is maybe the reason why no decision has been taken in that direction. Concerning European defense spending, I, I fully agree. We, we have to develop that further. Um, but I think it has an element which needs to be taken more into account, and that's a European defense industry. The problem is we have too many competing systems, airplanes, tanks. Mm. We have to reduce the number of systems. We have to develop a strong European defense industry. And what we are seeing now is obviously that everybody is buying F-35, including Germany. But what we don't see is really a, de a development towards uh, a European defense industry. But I share Joao's point. We have to see security in a broader sense. So I think the strategic decision towards Ukraine, Western Balkans, I think, is also an important element. So I would leave it with that, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. And then fi finally, from Alexei, final words from you. Thank you. My final words are we are very thankful. And we know we will win. That should be some optimism. We will win. We will win together. That will be our... And that will be our common victory, victory of all free world. And after this, I, I am sure we will become much stronger together and we will move the whole planet in the right direction. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, it was a brilliant session, fantastic speakers. Thank you to everyone who's watching online. Uh, just a big thank you to uh, Conrad Adenauer Foundation, our friends, for joining, uh, for partnering with us uh, on this event. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about what we do at Bright Blue, defending and improving liberal society, please speak to my colleague Max at the back. Uh, and if we could have another round of applause for our fantastic speakers. Thank you.